Are you ready? Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Welcome back to Fireside Chat, and welcome to our first live show that we've ever produced. I'm Dan, and of course, I'm here along with Matt, and we're here to talk trade deadline. Matt, how you doing? Good. It was an interesting trade deadline. Not too many moves around the NHL, but good to see the Flames get a few pieces to add to their already deep team. Well, you know, let's just jump right into that. We'll review last week and do some of our usual stuff after. But the Flames made two trades at trade deadline. Nothing huge. Two incoming names that we really um, maybe weren't expecting to see. And those were Flames, I would say, some surprise deals. What about you? Did you think either one of these guys would become Flames? Well, I thought that when uh, Chris Stewart was placed on waivers yesterday, due to the fact that he's a right winger with size, that that would be a good fit for calgary just due to the fact that we need right wingers with size uh the nick shore trade that i like him as a player with when he was with la and the fact that he's a flame that's great he's a very good two-way center as the fourth liner and that's one of the things that the organization needs well let's take a look at these two flames let's talk about the guys that are coming in here and then two newest Calgary Flames. We have two Flames that came in today. The first one, I guess we'll start chronologically, is uh, Chris Stewart. Chris Stewart is uh, coming to us from Minnesota, but he's been all over the league. He's sort of a journeyman. And really, a, like you said, a right winger, right shot. He's a guy that apparently the Flames have been interested in for a while. He's a, a solid offensive guy. He plays a physical game. He's got some of that grit and truculence. He was the 2006 round one number 18 pick by the Colorado Avalanche. He's a 30-year-old right winger, six foot two. He weighs 231 pounds, and he has a contract that expires at the end of this season. But I imagine he'd be easy to re-sign if they want to. Maybe a guy who hasn't had as much success as we want him to. There's a guy who seems to go in streaks. He gets hot for about six weeks and then kind of tapers off. Matt, what are your thoughts about the acquisition of Chris Stewart? Well, I know one thing's for sure is that the advanced stats guys are going to be none too pleased about this trade because of the fact, or this claim off waivers just due to the fact that his Corsi numbers aren't fantastic. Stewart's one of those type of players that he is not an overly physical player, uh, even though he's willing to fight. It's he, kind of a bizarre thing, but he has a hard time sometimes going to the right areas uh, on the ice, and he, I think that's part of what the difference between how he was as a player in his early part of his career versus since then is that the he hasn't been consistent in going to the right spots on the ice to get goals when according to wild fans uh, anytime he's on a breakaway or in the shootout he's money for sure and it makes sense because of the fact that he is a very skilled player it's just that unfortunately he's not going to consistently bring you the offensive side of the game that you need but he is a decent overall two-way player and with other teams loading up with physical guys that helps especially like with vegas getting ryan reeves it kind of helps to offset that kind of thing this is not a guy who's going to be the number one right winger this is not a guy who's probably going to be in your top six this is really a depth signing and this is probably a good guy to either play on the fourth line or even potentially on that third line with Bennett and Jankowski. He's not going to solve your scoring woes like Matt was saying. I mean, he's only got 13 points uh, this season. I think his career high in the NHL is 36, and that was with St. Louis. But, you know, I think a guy who we could get 15, 20, maybe even 25 points from, and as a depth player, he can't ask for more than that from a guy who's going to be paid less than $2 million. No, and if you look at the one of the main problems that the Flames had in the early part of the season is the fact that the fourth line and, frankly, the third line were not generating any offense whatsoever. And you don't need them to chip in a lot, but you need them to chip in every once in a while. 
And for the longest time, guys like Stajan and Lazar and Brower had virtually zero goals, and that's just not acceptable if you're wanting to do anything, really. So getting but both Shore and Stewart will help just the, on the overall offensive side of the game, and especially getting Versteeg back from injury sometime next month, hopefully. That, too, will help just add some secondary offensive depth. If you listen to the Trill Living press conference today, he said just that. He said, you know, we've got this veteran coming. We've got uh, Versteeg coming back off of the IR, and that's really going to help, too. And he said that's one of the reasons they decided not to go out and get a big veteran, because they think they've got a pretty good player coming back. And I would agree. I think for a depth guy, I don't think you can get much better than Versteeg. Yeah, and it's one of those things that with the Flames faltering in the shootout a bit, getting a guy like Chris Stewart, who is one of the better guys in the NHL at that, that'll help. And when Versteeg gets back, that too will help. Um, overall, we didn't pay anything, so it's kind of hard to complain about that. You're getting a legitimate depth NHL player for nothing, so... You know, worst case scenario is that he occasionally sits in the press box. Okay. Well, let's talk about the guy we did pay something for. The Calgary Flames gave up their seventh round selection in the 2019 NHL entry draft, which is next year's draft. They still have a pick in that round. They have a seventh rounder that came to us from Carolina in the Eddie Lack deal. And this was a trade they made with Ottawa to acquire Nick Shore. Nick Shore is a right-handed centerman. Someone that his name sounds familiar to Flames fans. He was here, or his brother was here, uh, Drew Shore, in the past, so we know the Shore name. Matt, I know that you're a big fan of Nick Shore. What, what can fans expect from this guy? He's a physical two-way center. He, he's mostly a penalty killer guy. Uh, he will chip in 15, 20 points, and he's just solid defensively. I think this basically ends Matt Stage in playing the fourth line center role because Shore is a significant upgrade on stage in at this point and it gives the Flames additional depth in the center position I think that you'll see Shore remain there for the immediate future I don't see the Flames n now needing to get a fourth line center this offseason I think that Shore will probably end up having that spot for the next two or three seasons until he either we either get somebody else or draft somebody else or something like that. But for now, I think we're pretty much set. Let's learn a little bit about Nick Shore. He was uh, born in 1992. He's 25 years old. As we mentioned, a right-handed shot on center. He's six foot one, 187 pounds, from Denver, Colorado. Um, being 25, he is a free agent at the end of the year, but he's an RFA, so the Flames will retain his rights. And I totally agree with you. As soon as I saw this deal made, the first thing I thought was, there's the end of Matt Stajan. Like, we now have the replacement. Even if Stajan plays a little bit more this season, we have his replacement for next year. Yeah, and if you look at uh, Stajan, he could always slide over to the left-wing position for the time being, but I don't see... I think that's pretty much it, unfortunately, for him. Um, whenever we've played the Kings in the past, since Shore's been an NHLer, I've always he's always stood out as somebody that stands out in a positive way uh, when viewing the opposition. So uh, the fact that he's now on the Flames, I'm looking forward to that and hoping that he can continue to play well. I'm not expecting him to be anything more than a fourth line center, but if he can just contribute a little bit that's an upgrade over what we have yeah for sure i think you know he's he's much cheaper right now he's making 925 you can probably sign this guy next year for a million and a half so you save a lot of money there uh zacker 66 in the chat room said he would think that once staging gets to game 1000 12 games to go he'll come out of the lineup and nick shore probably goes into the lineup so there's probably a good good and good idea of what's going to happen there i think he could be totally right i think the flames want to definitely give matt stage in that thousandth game yeah and i don't i don't think that you necessarily have to leave shore off the lineup i think you can just put stage in as the left winger on the fourth line and that's fine like i don't see the need to 
sit sure just uh have stage and play as a dozen games what do you think the chances are that the flames i mean this guy's a right-handed centerman what do you think the chances are the flames try to convert him to a right winger I would actually be reticent to do that just due to the fact that he's a decent defensive guy overall. So, and that's it when you're dealing with a fourth liner it, and especially a center. If he's decent defensively, it's better to keep him there. If the the Flames had an absolute need to move him to the right side, then sure, but I don't, you know, like say if Brower got hurt, then sure, uh, why not? But. Uh, for now, I'd just leave Shore there. So two great pickups, and I mean, if you think about it, really, if you look at the cost for it, it was two players who are both NHL ready, two guys who no doubt will slot right into the Flames lineup for a seventh-round pick. And we've criticized uh, GM Tre Living in the past for trading away too many picks. I think this is a trade that is a no-brainer. I mean, what are you going to get with a seventh-round oh, pick yeah. anyways? Yeah, well, like, look at the past couple of seventh-round picks. You had Riley Bruce and Stefan Fulkowski, neither of which are in the organization, uh, just a couple of years later. So, you know, it, those ones are really dartboard time picks anyway. So the fact that if either of them play a game in the NHL, that's largely going to be a better return than whatever that pick will be. Unless whichever, you know, they actually hit the target with their pick, but, you know, only usually three or four players out of a, the seventh round actually make it anyway. So looking at the Calgary Flames roster right now, we see that third line, that Jankowski line. If Bennett gets returned to that line, I can totally see at this point Garnet Hathaway coming out of that line and Stewart being put on. What do you think? I agree. I think Hathaway is probably going to head to the press box once Furlan's back and actually what you said about having uh, Bennett with Jankowski and uh, Stewart I actually think it might be better to have Furland with Janko and Stewart just due to the makeup of the players on the line because Bennett did look good in his games up on the first line so well, and, you know, I think that you and I have had a bit of a differing opinion on this, but to me, I still think of Furland as an energy sort of grinder line guy. And I think if you were to have a line of, say, um, Furland on one side, Stewart on the other, and pick your centerman on that fourth line, Lazar, um, you know, whoever you sure. want to, Shore, yeah. I think you could really have a good fourth line, a good fourth energy line. Yeah. Well, it, Furlan's done an admirable job being the sniper for the two playmakers on the first line. It's just that if Bennett can do more besides just shooting the puck, then I think that overall would be a lot better for the the team as a whole. So it's just you have to wait and see uh, how each of the players respond. But with Furlan not likely to play in the next game give Bennett another opportunity on the first line and we'll see how things shake out if Bennett takes the ball and runs with it you just have to let him go and if you know that he doesn't then you put Furland back and you see how things go well and I've mentioned this a few times on previous episodes but I've been a fan of the uh, Johnny Hockey and Sam Bennett pairing we saw it in the preseason. You and I watched some of that group, and I said I thought it was a good pairing. So I really like the idea of having Bennett on that first line. Um, I'm not sure about Johnny on the right, but he looks like he's capable of doing it right now. So why not? But yeah, if you can, I mean, if you can put Bennett up there and get some more production out of him, even if it's only temporary to sort of boost his confidence, why don't we do that? Exactly. And if they start producing, then, hey, that's great. The Flames might actually win some games down the stretch, which would help for your playoff spot. So, Matt, going back to the trade deadline for a second, is there any player or deal that you wish the Flames would have done that they didn't? No, for, based on the price tags, not really, no. Were there, uh, a lot of the deals were overpayments, by and large. Like, even uh, the Evander Kane deal, which was just for a second-round pick and, like, spare parts after that, that's just purely as a rental because Kane's not going to re-sign with San Jose. So, and that doesn't make any sense for Calgary 
right now. Like, you might as well just wait till July 1st and sign them if that's what you want to do. Were there any players that you were happy, let's say, the Flames didn't pursue, seeing the price tag of what we've what we saw today? Well, Kane for one, uh, n- not really. I think Thomas Tatar uh, getting traded for a first, second, and third round pick was excessive. Um, Hartman getting dealt for a first was a bit of a surprise. Uh, beyond that, like it was just spare part players, so it nothing really exceptional so uh, there was nothing really that Calgary missed out on I think they did fairly well with the two acquisitions they made I'm somewhat surprised that Paul Stastny got dealt to Winnipeg I you know the Blues being right in the playoff hunt you wouldn't think that they'd be shedding players but you know uh, that's an interesting decision. Any trades from our rivals or teams right around us in the standings that you think might be worrisome to the Flames down the stretch or in the playoffs? Well, not really. Uh, like Realistically, the Flames, if they make the playoffs, are likely going to have to face one of either San Jose, Vegas, or Winnipeg. And, you know, if we play Winnipeg, like, that's not going to be a fun series, with, especially with them getting Stastny on top of their already deep team. But, like, Vegas didn't really improve much. They got Reeves, which is good, but doesn't really help. And Keane, it helps, but not really. Like, they're not going to be massively improved by that. So, not really. It... it, it it was a bit of a weird deadline where, like, nobody really, other than Tampa, they're the only ones that legitimately improved. Oh, yeah, I forgot Vegas got Tatar, too. Uh, I was going to say, that was, the big, that, that was the big Vegas deal. Yeah. Well, getting Tatar, that helps, too. So, yeah, Vegas is a little more dangerous than they normally are, but I still think they're a bit of a paper tiger when, once the playoffs start. I don't see them going far. I still think you're going to see the Flames make at least one big trade. I think probably one of the defensemen, I'm guessing Brody, but I think that happens at the deadline, I think. Or, sorry, not the deadline, at the draft. I think you're going to see a big deal done, but as we know, it's hard to get something worked out at the at the deadline because there's so much going on, and I really think that Trill Living is going to keep working the phones, and I would I would be surprised if we don't see one of the defensemen moved at the draft. Well, you look at Ottawa and how they were trying to sell basically everything in the kitchen sink, and I think that helped to cause the entire deadline to not function properly. So the fact that um, like basically everybody held off on deals, it's sort of like a couple of years ago when the Flames were stuck with Camilleri after the deadline just because everybody was trying to go for the big name that year. And I think the the same thing happened with Ottawa. Uh, I don't know that Calgary... Uh, I, I would guess that they're going to move a defenseman at some point for a forward. I would have preferred it being now, but if it's later, that's fine too. It's just, we'll see. It, you, we don't know how the team will respond over the next couple, couple of weeks and into the playoffs if they make it. And we see. Like, uh, if you would have said this time last year that we're going to have a completely new goaltending setup based on the, how they were doing at that point, I, I think everybody would have been shocked and, like, Why? But then the playoffs happened, and yeah, now we know. So it's, we'll see. And I think the Flames still need another scoring player of some sort in their lineup. But how that manifests itself, I don't know. And we'll see. Looking at a lot of the rumors that came out from, um, you know, pundits from the different hockey media there's a lot of talk the flames were thinking about moving gillies there's a lot of talk the flames were thinking about moving shillington there's a lot of talk the flames maybe were thinking about moving bennett and i'm glad that here we sit after the trade deadline and all three of those guys are calgary flames i think 
as much as I thought, okay, these are pieces we could move if we need to, I think that they're all pieces that for this team to to build long term, we need all those guys. Yeah, and the thing is, is that when you're dealing with what the Flames are basically trying to do in building a contender, a guy like Valimaki or Shillington or Anderson, they're going to have a price tag, but it's not going to be overly much versus what their potential is. Just because it's potential, it's not an actual developed asset. If Calgary can take the developed asset, which is, say, TJ Brody, and move them, you're going to get a higher price tag in return just because of the nature of you're getting a fully-fledged NHL quality top four defenseman. And where Anderson, Shillington, Valimaki, or Fox could easily develop into those players given the opportunity. And we saw this back a couple years ago with uh, the Nashville Predators when they traded Seth Jones to Columbus for Ryan Johansson. And it addressed a need that Nashville had in that they didn't have a high-quality center, and that helped them get to the Stanley Cup Finals, and they were able to replace that player internally with Matthias Ekholm, who at that point was their sixth defenseman and wasn't really being given much of an opportunity. And with the Flames, if they can leverage a guy like a TJ Brody for a legitimate top six forward, then they can shuffle whichever of the defenseman prospects that appear most ready, probably Anderson, into a... NHL spot and see if they can emerge as the next good player for the Flames. Sort of like what Chicago did when uh, Nick Chalmerson, because uh, Brian Campbell, they got had to get rid of him and they gave Chalmerson more of a role and he took off after that. And I think the Flames are going to be in that same spot where they're they got to shuffle some cap around via moving a defenseman for a forward and having the cheaper, younger option on defense. The other thing you see a lot, too, is by the draft, teams have a better idea of who may or may not re-sign with them. Um, you know, you, you sort of know at the deadline, but often there's that hope that you can get something done. So I think by the draft, when the Flames go to make that deal, you'll have another team who knows now, oh, crap, our defenseman we thought was going to come back isn't. And so, yeah, we really want to make that TJ Brody deal to shore that up because you'd rather pay the price of that at draft day than you would on July 1st. Yeah, and similarly, the there are some teams that are pushing in the upward trajectory and they'd rather shore up a defenseman where they might have drafted mostly forwards say like a Toronto where they especially if they have a bad playoff which I'm kind of expecting just due to the fact that their defense is kind of terrible you could leverage a defenseman for a forward from them just due to the fact that they have too much on the one and not enough on the other and that's how it works and so there are options more avail readily available but more information needs to come in via the rest of the season and the playoffs and how teams do because they can reassess where each of themselves are at and should we rebuild, should we not, blah, blah, blah. Matt, in the post-trade deadline media scrum today, GM Brad Living also said, or he was asked the question and confirmed it, that, yeah, the team was looking around a little bit for a veteran backup goalie but that they're very happy with the goalies that they have. And this brings us to a really interesting discussion. Mike Smith went down. He was down day to day. Just a couple days ago before the Colorado game, the Flames put him on the injury reserve. With a goalie playing as well as Smith has, you think that you would be upset if you lost him. Um, you know, what does this mean for this team? What happens if Mike Smith is down? But you got to admit that the team of Riddick and Gillies has stepped up and played really well. And I think they probably both know what's on the line here, that one of them is going to get a backup job. But what are your thoughts on this tandem and what we've seen from them so far? Well, I think that Riddick has played well when he's only playing a little bit. And he's looking to be a high-quality backup at this point. 
Um, sort of like Staylock with San Jose or Dell now with San Jose. Uh, where just if he's not playing every game, he'll be a really good player for you and can leave you saying, oh, this guy should be the starter. But it seems that like once he gets a handful of games in, in a row that he starts to wane a bit. And that's understandable. He's even in the AHL, he hasn't played consistently as the starter for large stretches of time. He he was Gilly's backup both last year and this year, so it makes some sense that uh, he's struggling a little bit when playing on back to back. Gilly's, on the other hand, he's looked very well in all of his appearances and. For me, he's right now is the front runner to supplant Smith when his contract is done. Whether that continues or not, we'll see. I'd let him continue to start until he starts to his play starts to wane a bit, and we'll just play it by ear. You know, it, it, when you have two goalies that are both very young and inexperienced. You just got to kind of run with the hot hand and see what you have. It, it, goaltending is not a linear thing where, like, with a forward, you can expect them that if he's a scoring forward, that he puts the puck in the net. With goalies, it's kind of a crapshoot. But if they actually figure it out, then you've got somebody who could be a long term option for the Flames. And that's what we need. So, it more opportunities for each of them helps just to get a better picture of what you have you know you were mentioning how riddick looked good in small doses and really as a backup that's all you need to do i mean this is an unusual scenario where he's had to play what five games now so as a backup as long as you can do the one game here the end of a back-to-back -back there that's what we need from a backup goaltender i think riddick has performed very admirably as that backup but you know watching the colorado game we'll talk more about this later I actually am liking watching Gilly's game better than I am Riddick's game right now. Yeah, and it makes sense that the Flames recalled Riddick initially once they uh, removed Lack from the lineup, just due to the fact that you knew that Smith was going to play the bulk of the games anyway. So having Riddick there, who is used to only playing a couple of times a month, that's fine. And... and He's done well up until Smith went down, just due to the fact that he's not used to playing as much as he is, and he has still played fairly decently, not as good as he has, but decent enough. But Gillies, though, he looks like a starting goaltender. He profiles as a starting goaltender and should become one at some point. We just have to see if that time is sooner than later. Realistically, you know, think... moving forward, I'd probably keep Riddick as the backup, though, once Smith returns, just due to the fact that he's more used to playing in that fashion. Yeah, I agree. I'd probably keep Riddick here. Um, just as a paper note, the Flames had to make any transaction today for guys sending them to the AHL that they want eligible for the playoffs. Both Riddick and Gillies were sent down to the AHL and then immediately recalled. And as well, on Andrew Mangiapani has been sent back down to the AHL. He was not automatically recalled, so he'll be back with Stockton. Um, interesting that Tanner Glass was not sent down, so that means he's not eligible for AHL playoffs and therefore will probably stay with the Flames for the rest of the year. Which, you know, you have no upper roster limit. Why not keep some muscle here? Yeah, and... Um he's a good character guy and that's part of the reason why he's he, despite being just a mediocre player overall he's been able to stick with a lot of organizations just because of his personality and character and that's important and especially with the flames going into a playoff run you need to have players that are veterans to help guide the team down the stretch and even though he might not be the best player on the ice he helps off the ice and that's where Chris Stewart comes in as being a helpful player and uh, even sure because of his experience with the LA Kings that all of those type of players help 
just to flesh out some of the lack of veterans that I think that the Flames have had partially, which has caused a bit of a problem because you need consistency from some players in your lineup and the young players tend to be a little bit more inconsistent and the veterans tend to be, you know what you're getting. And so it's good overall. Well, Matt, let's go back for a second to the goaltenders. You'd mentioned the goaltenders earlier. I agree with you. I think once um, once Smith is back, I would keep Riddick up here for the remainder of the season as the backup. I think next season, though, it's a very difficult decision to make as to who should have that backup role. We have one more year with Mike Smith on contract, and I think that the Flames were up to this point looking at Gillies as being the next heir apparent, but now we also have Tyler Parsons in the mix who looks like he could be that guy. So I think it's going to be a really interesting decision in the offseason to say, do you bring Gillies up as the backup next year? Do you bring Riddick back as the backup next year? I think that one of those guys has to stay, and I don't know the other one can be sent back to the AHL. I think you need to make room next year in the AHL for Parsons, maybe for McDonald. So it's going to be some interesting juggling to see what the Flames do in the offseason. Well, and a secondary option, which is a feasibility, is trading Mike Smith. And if Gillies and Riddick both play well over the next little bit, you could conceivably run with that next year. Anaheim did with Anderson and Gibson for a while, and they didn't look bad, so it's entirely feasible. That way you get more of a idea with each of them next season. It, it just, yeah, it's tough, though. It's one of those problems that, gee, we have too many good goalies in the organization, you know, I, I think that every single team would like that problem. So, we'll see. Uh, I will have to just evaluate based on the rest of the season, really, in the playoffs if the, the Flames make it, what the next step is. And if Gillies or Riddick really steal the show, then, hey, that's great. We'll see. I think that having those two guys as your goalie tandem next year if you're a playoff team or want to be a playoff team is premature. I don't see Gillies and Riddick being able to hold down the fort there. If we weren't a playoff team, if we were a Buffalo or an Edmonton or something like that, maybe. I just don't see those guys being ready for the full-time work yet. I think Mike Smith stays around for one more year. I think the plan was always to have Smith as a transitional starter. And then after that, the next guy emerges, whether that's Parsons, whether that's yeah, Gillies. I, agree. I don't see them moving Smith. I think with what they've done with Smith so far, the familiarity he has with the GM, I don't see him moving. Um, I'd be shocked if he moved. But I think that we have to decide by the end of, let's say, next season, who that starter is. I don't think they're going to go out and bring in another big-name starter. I think the feeling no. is that that starter is internal whether it's Riddick, whether it's Gillies, whether it's Parsons, I think two of those guys in the 2020 season 2019-2020 will be our goalie tandem I agree entirely I think Parsons could be something special, I think it's worth uh, bringing Parsons along slowly so I could see it being Gillies as the starter, Riddick as his backup for a year or two until Parsons forces one of them out of that spot I agree, and I think that you'll continue with Parsons and whichever after that. We'll see. It, it, it's one of those good problems to have, and we'll just have to wait and see. And goalies aren't entirely consistent regardless, so especially the younger ones, you don't know. Like, a guy could look like a future all-star one year and then flame out the next, so... Well, even look up north. Uh, Cam Talbot looked like probably the best goalie in the NHL last year. And this year he came back down to earth and has been borderline terrible. So, you know, it, you just don't know. And, you know, I think when you look around the league, too, that there's so many teams that want a good young goalie that whichever one we decide to part with, when we decide to part with them, we'll be able to bring a nice return for the Flames. And that's always a nice thing to have, too, is that guy that you know has sort of found money, especially if it's a guy like Riddick, who we paid nothing to acquire. 
anything you can get for him becomes a bonus. Exactly. And the Flames will have three options to choose from, so pick the two that you like the best and carry on. My thoughts right now, I think David Riddick is a career backup. Um, I don't think he ever gets that starting role for a contender team at least. So I can see the Flames going in uh, twenty the 2020 season with Gillies and Riddick to start with and then eventually bringing Parsons up as the backup and having a Gillies-Parsons team and move move on from Riddick. Yeah, that's possible. It's so hard to project with goaltenders, so. though. The other interesting thing in that season, too, is we'll have to think about a potential... We'll have to also think about a potential expansion draft and losing one of them to Seattle. That's about the time they'd mm-hmm. be coming in the league as well. So, lots to think about there. Um, Matt, before we move off of it, anything else deadline-based you want to talk about? Uh, well, congrats to the Edmonton Oilers for trading two of their players off for third-round picks. And, you know, so basically they got nothing because they haven't hit on a second-round or beyond in a very long time, so... That helps, I guess. The one team that does nothing past the first yeah. round. Like, what? Who's the? who have the Oilers ever drafted outside that first round? I this think time? Jeff Petrie is the only guy that I can recall in the last, like, 10, 12 years that has ever done anything. So, yeah. You might as well just pack it in after the first round if you're the Oilers. So, get them getting third round picks. Both of them were great value for the players that they traded. It's just, unfortunately... It being Edmonton, you might as well just throw those picks in the trash. The NHL can save some costs. They can have Edmonton maintain that table for rounds one, two, and three, then vacate it and Calgary come in and start picking yeah. in round four. Same table. We'll just share it with the two Alberta teams. Um, well, Matt, why don't we do what we would usually do at the top of the show and take a look at the last week of Flames hockey. I thought a fairly good week for the Flames, all things considered. The Flames started off the last week of hockey in uh, in Nevada, their first game in Nevada, to take on the Vegas Golden Knights. This was, as we talked about last week, the start of the moms trip. The players brought all their moms on this trip. And from the sounds of it, talking to some of the media guys and talking to some of the players, the moms were more rambunctious than the boys Well, were. that's exactly what I said last week, that the bo- moms were going to get in more trouble than the players. So it's good. You know, uh, it's nice that they got a vacation out of the deal and, you know, got to see their kids play. So that's good for the Flames to have done that and arranged that for everybody. And the second game that we've ever played against Vegas and the second time we've been blown out by them. The Flames ended up losing this one with a 7-3 to three score. Um, I thought the first period didn't look too bad, and then after that, I think the game really got away from the team. What's your well? I think one? the game turned on that overturned goal on the offside, and when you need to crack out the electron microscope to determine whether it's an offside, I think that the goal should count. And I think that rule is one of the stupidest rules that the NHL has ever come up with, and that includes the foot in the crease rule that led to Brett Hull winning the Stanley Cup for Dallas back in the 90s. But, you know, it just, like, for a league that's starving for offense, letting a goal like that where the guy's foot is clearly on the blue line but just, like, an inch off the ice, like, that's BS. And... I thought that's one of those things that it should be that the call on the ice stands unless the coach challenges yeah, it. Yeah, and it is what it is. And that the game turned right there, and the Flames just kind of packed it in. And, you know, like it, it was BS, but unfortunately the team didn't respond well to it, and that was that. And... Overall, it wasn't a terrible game. The, they were going up against the best team in the West, so you can't really complain too much about losing, but that should have been a game that they could have won. And I think if that the game was 4-4, I don't think the Flames lose that one in regulation, but it is what it is. At least this one wasn't as crazy as the last time we played Vegas, where we were pretty much you know playing pretty even, and then... Things blew up in the yeah. last three minutes. Well, at least Froelich didn't score on his own net. That's true. Ever since he's taken the, what do you call it, the half visor off his mouth, he seems to be back to himself. Yeah. 
Well, the next night, the Flames left Nevada, stayed in, in the desert area, and they were in Phoenix, taking on the Arizona Coyotes, or I guess in Glendale. This was the game where John Gillies, as I predicted last week, made the got the start. Gillies made 35 saves against Arizona, uh, who had won four straight up to this point, and the Flames ended up beating the Desert Dogs by a score of 5-2. to two. And, you know, this really wasn't a surprise to me. This is a, a team who's taking on one of the worst teams in the league. You should be able to beat them handedly. So this is about what I expected. I thought that Gillies looked good in the start. Um, we saw this was where we debuted the new look Flames first line. Sam Bennett played on that first line with Goudreau and Monaghan. And again, I thought that line looked really good. And after that Goudreau goal now, the Flames have four 20 goal scorers, which is pretty much, you know, what you want. On a team that's going to be a playoff team, you need everyone contributing. Also, an interesting note here was that all three members of that new look first line scored in this game. So obviously, it's a pretty successful and and a line you want to stay with. Yeah, uh, out, outside of the first minute or two, uh, when Gillies had that gave up that early goal and then that weird turnover. Uh, it, after that, he settled down and looked excellent like frankly i wouldn't know he wasn't a veteran starting goaltender from that point forward yeah i and, thought he was shaky for about the first 10 minutes yeah but once he settled down and got the anxiety out of the way then he was fine the flames really the 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 coyotes are terrible and this is one where you should be embarrassed if you lose to them if you're wanting to be a playoff team so they got the two points. That's great. And on to the next. And, you know, a good game. I think they needed that after the Vegas game to keep everybody motivated and on track. And um, I just thought it was a, a good win that way. Yeah. Well, the next game, the Flames came back home to the Saldome after a short road swing. They took on a team that we didn't expect to be good this year, but who's challenging us for a playoff spot. And that's the Colorado Avalanche. We know how this team does at home, so weren't sure what to expect in this game. John Gillies got his second start in a row and his first uh, regular season start in the Saddle Dome as the Calgary Flames ended up winning a 5-1 to one game against the Colorado Avalanche. Um, Matt, I know you didn't really watch all this game, so I'll give some of my thoughts here. I thought that Gillies looked really good in most of this whole game. I thought it wasn't like the game before it where he needed 10 minutes to get ready. I thought that he was pretty much ready to go right from the beginning. He probably knew what to expect now from an NHL start. And I thought that the Flames had a really good first period. Um, it was pretty much all Calgary. And I think that really set the tempo here. And the, the Flames came out hard, they played hard, and they kept playing hard. That, that Colorado goal in the first was an unfortunate accident. The puck looked like it bounced off Gilly's button into the net. So not really an own goal, but nothing that he could really do for that one. He'd probably like to have it back if he could, but at least he got the win. And the thing that I think was notable here is that the Flames really kept their foot on the gas the whole time. Um, they never let up, and I talked to the coach after the game, and the coach even said, you know, I said, so what has been happening differently in this game and the game before this to get the two wins in a row. And he just said, we've been building on our lead. We get the lead, we don't let up, and we just build on it. And he said, when you start getting up three, four, five goals, it's tough to lose the game at that point. So sounds like that's what he's been telling the players to do. Well, that's been one of the main problems that the Flames have had for most of the season is that they get a, a little bit of a cushion and then they sit on it. And other teams find a way to get back even and the flames usually end up losing those games and from for most of december and january that was the case where if the flames led after two periods the other teams would find a way back into the game and that is not a recipe for success <laughs> in the the nhl you need to be able to put people away and collect the two points and especially a playoff rival like the avalanche are they needed the two points and it was very encouraging to see the fact that they were able to put them away and with the flames remaining schedule i think they only play three games against teams that are in the top 10 in the standings so they need to be able to especially with the games that are in that middle tier that they're going to be battling against four playoff spots 
they need to be able to beat them and handily if at all possible so that way that they're not giving up points to those teams that are trying to get back into the playoff race with them. I was talking to some of the Flames players in the dressing room after the game and you know kind of saying this shows that there is no dome curse you can do this you guys can get that win that big win at the dome so whatever's changed whatever it was mentally or physically or whatever you guys did you need to keep doing that because we now know okay we can do this how do we keep that going and you know pretty much the captain said well that's the big you know that's the big thing we have to do is build on this win so hopefully they'll be able to do that and keep that win going and you know just keep that momentum going because right now they are back in a wild card spot they're in the second wild card spot with 73 points st louis is one point down on us la two points down on us and we have one point uh difference between dallas and anaheim so the flames are right back in the thick of things we'll see how some of the deadline moves affect our rivals but you can't let off the gas at this point no and if you look at the other teams that are in that same range none of them really improved much at all and i think st louis could end up falling because of the stasny thing yeah and like anaheim they did they got chris kelly through signing them that's not really gonna help too much dallas didn't do anything la they got fun off but that's mm, okay like i i don't see that helping a ton for enough doesn't win you a cup. no uh, so like if you look at the teams that are in our neighborhood in the standings like the only team that got better was san jose so you know uh, calgary with the weak schedule and shoring up the depth with shore and steward uh they should be able to at hopefully push forward into one of the at top three seeds in our division and likely face San Jose in round one. That's I'm hoping that we don't get one of the wild card spots and have to play either the Jets or the Golden Knights in the first round just because you know anytime you can put off those teams for a round that helps. <laughs> Uh, Matt, the Flames officially updated their roster while we were recording. It looks like Chris Stewart will earn number eight for the Calgary Flames. Uh, Nick Shore's number is still to be determined. He should get his so brother's be... old number. What was his brother's old number? Uh, I think 26, but um, don't quote me on that. Well, 26 is taken. Uh, true. Yeah. Well, we'll see. So you could maybe wear 62. He, he wore 21 in... Uh, I think he'd be the first ever to wear that for Calgary. Think, so Yeah, Drew Shore wore, I want to say 22. But I'd, I'd have to look yeah. it up. Whatever. So, yeah. I don't know. He was a very memorable player, as you he's can tell. He's one of those guys, he's like, you know, Corbin Knight. He's come and he's gone before he even knew the guy's name. Um, one more roster transaction move to announce. <clears throat> the Calgary Flames have officially signed Cody Golabuff. He's been playing with the Stockton Heat for most of the year. This was uh, really a paper deal. Um, apparently, the Flames wanted to sign him earlier in the year. He didn't really want to sign simply because he wanted the chance to go to the Olympics. So he didn't want to sign with the Calgary Flames before the Olympics. Um, now that the Olympics are over, the Flames inked him to a two-way deal and reassigned him back to Stockton where he'll continue to play. Golubov, for those that don't know about him, he's a little bit of an older player. Cody Golubov is 28 years old. He's a six foot one defenseman, 201 pounds, drafted in round two by the Columbus Blue Jackets. Never really turned out the way everyone thought that he would. And he's been he's playing in the AHL this year and played in the AHL last year. I can honestly see Golubov end up being Matt Bartkowski next year. I can see him being the number seven here in Calgary. Yeah. Why not? Like, if there's injuries to, like, say, Barkowski or Kulak, I think Golbuff might be a guy that gets recalled. But it just gives the Flames flexibility to see basically whomever gets, if anybody gets injured, it's just another option to throw out there. Also a guy on the farm who has some NHL depth. Yeah, it's not anything that makes a big deal, but if the flames run into three or four injuries then hey you have a veteran available that can 
mop up, basically. Doing the math here, Golubov has played 129 NHL games. He has two goals, 21 total NHL assists for 23 total NHL points. So, guy who's played, you know, really, if you look at it, about a season and a half in total NHL time. So, probably a good guy to have in the farm who can get, give some guidance and mentorship of what it means to be at least, you know, a little bit in the NHL. Yeah. Outside of that, Matt, I don't think there's really anything else to talk about. It was a slow deadline day. We got a couple depth pickups, and Treliving did say today that the Flames are working to get both of those depth pickups to join the team in Dallas tomorrow. So we'll see if they're both there. I wouldn't be surprised to see them both in the lineup. Yep, and it it's not a sexy transactions set of transactions for the Flames. But, you know, the Flames, ideally they would have gotten a top six forward. But if you're looking at the price tags that were paid, it would have been stupid to do that right now. And the Flames needed, just like last year when they got uh, uh, Stone on defense, uh, just to get an NHL defenseman due to the fact the Flames only had three NHL defensemen, they just needed a warm body back there. And I think that with the lack of talent on the fourth line getting two NHL caliber bodies to play there helps significantly and hopefully the Flames can with the added depth and caliber of talent on that depth that they can parlay that into some success overall the interesting thing if you look is the Flames have made a deal with Ottawa two years in a row now at the trade deadline yep. last year they acquired Curtis Lazar and this year they've acquired um, Nick, Sh- Nick Shore. So interesting to see that that's becoming a regular trade partner for Calgary. I can't remember before that when the last time we traded with Ottawa was. Oh, gee. Yeah, it's been a long time. Uh, not Definitely not regular trading partners. But especially with how things are with that organization, it, it could very well be a good partner at the draft especially if they're wanting like a more cost controlled defense core moving forward for some of their forwards that are available the flames could be a good partner with them we'll see yeah we'll see what happens well matt last week as always we did our weekly poll and the poll question that we asked everybody was what do you think of michael backland's new contract the majority of the uh respondents said not bad, not good. The Flames played about the market rate. I think they're probably about right on that. That was 50% of respondents. 33% said, I want to retain Backlund, but don't like this contract. And 16% said it's too long and or too expensive. So a little bit of everything on that Backlund contract. I think, you know, if you look at it down the road, I think it might be a little expensive up front. But I think overall, we're going to look at that and say, yeah, it's going to be a good deal two, three, four years into it. What do you think on that one? Well, I I like both the term and the con- dollar amount. So the Flames have their first, second, and third line centers for the next handful of years. So don't have to worry about the most important forward position for a long time. So that's it. It was one of those deals that it needed to be done. Period. End of sentence. The the Flames don't have anybody else really coming up anytime soon. So. It's it was imperative that they get it done. With the Nick Shore deal, I would argue that we probably now have our number four for next year as well. Yep, I agree. Well, this week's uh, poll question is, how do you feel about the Flames' trade deadline moves? We want to know what you think. Do you think the Flames should have done more? Did they do the right amount? Do you wish that maybe they would have done less? Let us know what you think. Maybe they should have gambled big and gone and paid a high price. You can always vote by going to firesidechat.ca. You'll see the poll on the homepage. You can go to twitter.com slash firesidepodcast. We'll have it pinned to the top of the page or on our Facebook page at facebook.com slash firesidepodcast. We are also going to ask everybody this week, if you can, to let one of your friends, let a Flames fan know about our podcast. We want to grow our audience a little bit, and the best way to do that is through referrals. So let a Flames fan know about the podcast, and or go ahead and in whatever application you use to subscribe to the podcast, be it Stitcher, iTunes, Google Play, leave us a review, and that's going to help us get out to more Flames fans as well. But we really want more Flames fans to know about the show. 
And that's also why so we're Maddie, doing this video show, so that way we're just not two random voices in the dark that nobody can see. Uh, so, I'm looking at the stats right now. We actually have somebody from England and somebody from Great Britain watching our show right now. So some overseas Flames fans, it looks like. Yeah. Well, Matt, are you ready to look ahead at the coming week? Indeed we are. The Flames have... A couple games. They've got four games in the next week. Three of them on the road, and one of them will be at home. The Calgary Flames tomorrow night are in Dallas to take on the Stars. It's expected that the new number eight, Chris Stewart, and Nick Shore will be in the lineup in that game. And then they have a back-to-back with Colorado on the 28th, the chance to hopefully cream Colorado again. Then the Flames get a couple days, well, one day off, and on March 2nd, they will be in Calgary to take on the New York Rangers, and then they're back on the road to take on the Pittsburgh Penguins on Monday. Uh, note that the Penguins game is a 5 p.m. start time, and the uh, Dallas game is a 6 p.m. start time. Otherwise, we're back to our usual 7, 7.30s that we're used to. So, Matt, we still got some more road games. We're doing well on the road. Four games up there, which means eight points total. How do you think the team does this week? The Flames need six points, and I think that they'll win every one of them except for the Colorado game. I think that the Avalanche gets some revenge. I wouldn't be surprised. Um, how do you see the goaltending pairings working out? I think uh, Gillies and Riddick split the back-to-back, and I think that Gillies gets the other ones. Uh, yeah, I think right now what we're going to see is a play-till-you-lose type mentality. Unless you lose, you don't look good, and at that point you'll come out and the other guy will go in. I really don't think that they have a one and two right now. Um, I think the Flames will beat Dallas. I think that's going to be a good look at if we're a playoff team of how we do against Dallas. I think the Flames are going to beat Colorado and beat New York. So I think they'll win the first three and lose to Pittsburgh. Um, I think New York, again, is one of those teams we better lose to. They've just lost pretty much a lot of their key pieces. So if we can't beat them, we've got some issues. Yeah. Well, the Flames just need points, period. And they just need to win. And uh, it it's getting to that point of the season where they have, I think, 19 games left. They need to win 13 at least if they want to make the playoffs and be in a divisional seed spot. So it, it's one of those things that with so many teams that are bunched together in the standings, it, they do play each other more. So the Flames do have an opportunity to surpass most of them if they can just be consistently beating the, both them and other teams. And they just need points. That's all. Looking ahead to our March schedule a little bit, the Flames have a road swing and then they come back to Calgary for New York, Edmonton, San Jose, Anaheim, Columbus, and another Edmonton game. So the Flames, for better or for worse, are going to be at home more. I think that's going to help them. I think they're going to do okay at home this month. Um, but we'll we'll see how that one shakes down. But I, I do think they're getting off the road a little bit. You can tell they're getting a little road weary. And I think that being home more often is going to be good for this team in March. Yeah, well, especially if they can turn their home record around and actually start using it to their advantage instead of being borderline terrible at home like they have been for most of the season. And I think that's just detail work uh, on their part. I think if they're a little bit more attentive to details instead of trying to put on a good show, I think that's the important thing. And hopefully they can start rolling off some wins like the Colorado game and get on a roll. Uh, They just need to get points, period. And hopefully home ice is only, I think, two points away. So, you know, it's not like a huge obstacle to uh, overcome. They can easily get that if they just play up to their potential. Well, Matt, enjoy these games this week. Enjoy seeing Chris Stewart and Nick Shore in Flames jerseys, and we will talk next week about how they do in their Flames debuts. Um, I'm expecting them both to debut in Dallas. Treliving did say it's going to be a little logistically difficult to get Nick Shore there just because of when the deal took place, but you know what? There's the NHL. They're good at that. So enjoy watching those guys. Enjoy watching the rest of this team, and we will talk to you next week for another episode of Fireside Chat. Thank you for tuning into our live broadcast, and 
as always, go Flames, go. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.